So um, my name is Dominic Vernon. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University School of Medicine uh, in the Department of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. And I wanted to talk to you all today about incomplete uh, facial paralysis. Um, so this will be about 30 minutes or so. That's usually about all I can kind of stand it in one lecture at a time in terms of keeping everyone's attention and, and, and my attention myself. So uh, we'll discuss this and then have some time afterwards if anyone has any questions as well. All right. So just as an overview, um, I want to go over briefly kind of the boring stuff, right? The natural course of incomplete paralysis and its prognosis, and then talk about our treatment paradigm and how it's uh, seen kind of a shift in our approach, especially over the last decade uh, for this particular disease process. And then we'll go over management strategies. And I'll talk about maintaining a balance for these patients. Um, we'll go over what I'm calling increasing input versus weakening wires. And we'll go into a little bit more into that when I get to that portion of the talk. Um, and then we'll talk briefly uh, about some more new and emerging techniques for this patient population. And then go over uh, the, a decision process of when to operate and what to offer um, for these patients. Um, and so the focus for this talk is not really a nuts and bolts of how to do the surgeries or techniques for these patients, um, but more so how to think about incomplete facial paralysis um, and to develop a strategy and a plan for these patients. And so my goals for this lecture are for you to understand the multifactorial issues of incomplete facial paralysis, uh, learn about surgical options for treating the weakness portion of the disease, but also realize that hypertonicity in this disease process is increasingly uh, important and then talk about treatment options for this as well. And then lastly, I think uh, I like for these set of slides to really serve as a reference point for counseling these patients in regards to what options they have available and perhaps when to consider some of the more invasive options. And so we'll go over the, the boring stuff first and kind of get it out of the way. Uh, we all know that Bell's palsy uh, is about 66% of all cases of facial paralysis. Um, it is the most common cause of our incomplete picture. Uh, the incidence is about 10 and 40 and 100,000. We do know that there tends to be a bimodal pattern to recovery uh, with a subset of patients having a much quicker recovery and then a second subset um, having a much more delayed response. Uh, Ramsey Hunt is the second most common cause of incomplete facial paralysis if we're excluding iatrogenic and neoplasms. The incidence is much lower though at 20 to 40 out of a million patients. We know that Bell's is acute unilateral idiopathic, um, usually occurs uh, in onset and completeness in 48 to 72 hours. Uh, there is thought process behind it that there may be an autoimmune component to this or possibly HSV1. We do know that the initial severity of the bells is important in terms of correlating with both the duration of the paralysis as well as the extent of the recovery for these patients. Um, but generally, the prognosis is very favorable, especially with corticosteroids. Um, we think that up to 90% can experience a full recovery. Um, but we do have this smaller subset anywhere, if you look in our literature, from 6 to 27%. Uh, with this partial recovery, that persistent weakness, asymmetry, and synkinesis. Um, I think an important point for Ramsey Hunt is that uh, you should note that it generally is more severe um, and much more likely to be incomplete in its recovery. This is a zoster reactivation. Uh, you see the eruptions in vesicles in your dermatomal distribution. Um, the recovery is much worse, okay? So complete recovery variable again in the literature, but much lower at 16 to 40%, and up to half of these patients with persistent paresis, um, and especially synkinesis. Um, and so if you see patients initially with Ramsey Hunt, um, you know, generally you wanna counsel them uh, that their chances of recovery um, potentially is much less than a typical Bell's palsy picture. Regardless of the cause of the incomplete facial paralysis, uh, we're left with a, a fairly common picture once they have developed this, uh, 
Um, and that is an element of asymmetry, right? Um, but it's not just ptosis, um, as we're all aware, right? And so the asymmetry here, you can see the tonic brow, the lack of creases in the brow, the asymmetric smile. Um, but we find that it's not just weakness, right? That's certainly a component of it. Uh, but hypertonicity is, is just as important in this process, right? And so we can see here in this patient, uh, the prominent platysmal banding on the affected side, um, even with a very minimal effort of smiling. Uh, and then synkinesis is, is really probably the big problem for most of these patients, right? And so when this patient has an increased effort smiling, you see that obvious contraction of the orbicularis oculi. Um, and so how do we assess or how do we grade these patients? Uh, just a few slides and a few notes on this. You know, a house Bragman to describe these patients really in my mind is not adequate, um, especially if you're just talking about documentation in your notes. Um, the challenges and the subtleties in describing the issues these patients have are, are complex. So to put one number down one through six um, is not really descriptive enough. So, you know, where possible, um, I think we need to try to be more descriptive. Um, you can use something like the Sunnybrook scale, uh, which takes into account all the issues that are important for these patients, right? Not just resting symmetry, uh, but symmetry of voluntary movement as well as synkinesis. Um, another one that's come out um, from Mass Ioneer in the from Mass Ioneer with Dr. Hadlock's group is the E-FACE uh, score, right? Uh, which takes into account 16 components that again account for, uh, you know, static appearance, voluntary movement, and synkinesis, all of which I think are very important for describing this subset of patients um, and much more descriptive uh, than just using a, a one through six house bracket. So our treatment paradigm for these patients has certainly evolved um, as, our, as our options in general for facial paralysis has evolved over the last decade or so. You know, certainly we all started with static procedures, you know, uh, brow lifts, uh, mid-face lifts, um, static slings. Um, but then we realized that Botox was increasingly important uh, for both complete paralysis and incomplete paralysis and helping to achieve greater symmetry for these patients. Um, then can kind of the next step up uh, in terms of nerve transfers, right? Uh, so five, seven transfers or even, a, you know, hypoglossal transfers uh, to, for our complete facial paralysis patients to help with movement. Um, and then kind of, you know, what we consider kind of that Cadillac surgery for a complete facial paralysis or facial paralysis, free tissue transfer with your gracilis free flaps. And so our options have really ballooned for these patients. Right, but we still need to think of these incomplete facial paralysis in, in kind of a different and separate category uh, than our complete facial paralysis patients. And that's because um, they have what I'll call a treatment paradox, right? So they do have some muscle weakness as a part of their incomplete recovery, but equally so, right, they have an issue with hypertonicity, okay? Now I need breaks in my lecture and I've uh, titled this a push and pull, right? between the muscle weakness and hypertonicity. And so I periodically will throw in just a few little breaks here. Um, I'll give you a second to look at this. I would say probably about half of you are loving this slide and probably the other half is probably just you no know, high stress. All right, so a paradox, right? So we need to think about addressing both of these issues when we talk about treating these patients. And so I'm gonna talk about maintaining the, right? And what am I talking about? I'm talking about increasing the input, right, for the paresis side of things versus weakening the wires, right, for those synkinetic hyper, you know, hypertonic muscles that are continuing to fire and cause problems, right? So what do we do? What are our options for increasing input for these patients? Um, I'm sure the vast majority of you are familiar with the 5-7 nerve transfer, right, utilizing the masseteric nerve from the masseter muscle, which is in close proximity to a buccal branch, all right, and then uh, dividing the masseter branch and then hooking it up, right, to a buccal branch to increase the input and hopefully increase the smile excursion, right? The other option for that is a cross-face nerve graft, right, uh, using a sural nerve, harvesting it from the leg, and then driving the input uh, from the unparalyzed, unaffected side, right, dividing a uh, redundant buccal branch from the unaffected facial nerve tunneling that nerve graft across the face and then hooking it up to a buccal branch on the affected side 
um, again, to drive movement and hopefully uh, spontaneous movement in the case of the cross-facial nerve graft. Um, and so these are great, certainly great techniques uh, for complete facial paralysis in which you don't, have not yet achieved muscle atrophy. Um, in terms of using them for an incomplete facial paralysis, there's certainly a little less data in the literature, um, but certainly people do still do it. Uh, this is a study just done in 2018, uh, a pretty small set of patients, about 28, but trying to compare uh, a cross face versus a 5-7 for these incomplete facial paralysis patients. Um, and you can see here in the small subgroup, not surprisingly, they did notice a greater displacement of the commissure, right? So greater commissure excursion with a 5-7 as opposed to the cross face nerve graft. That certainly shouldn't be surprising for those of us doing this routinely for complete paralysis, as we know that the 5-7 the is stronger in terms of its excursion in general uh, than the cross-face nerve graft. And there was a statistically significant difference between that subgroup. Um, you know, interesting to note, the, despite maybe the greater commissure excursion, um, there was not a difference in the patient satisfaction uh, between these two subgroups. Um, and on another interesting note, they actually didn't note a significant difference between spontaneity, even though one was a 5-7, which traditionally we think of uh, as needing to bite down to initiate that smile. And so uh, for those of you who haven't seen a 5-7, you can do this through a pretty, pretty minimally uh, accessed kind of an approach, a pretty limited preauricular incision um, using the subzygomatic triangle uh, to use, a, use your landmarks to identify the masseter nerve, um, and then finding that redundant uh, buccal branch in close proximity. Right. So this can be a pretty simple outpatient surgery. And this is just your slides demonstrating your uh, subzygomatic triangle, okay, utilizing uh, your uh, zygoma, uh, and then the uh, temporal mandibular joint as landmarks and bisecting uh, that arrow, bisecting that, those lines is generally the direction in which your masseter nerve is gonna lie. And so again, kind of the uh, gold standard, if you will, for increasing input, kind of the most invasive um, is your gracilis free flap. I would say uh, most of us are not doing this, right, for incomplete facial paralysis, but there may be a subset of patients in which you might consider it. Uh, this is the multi-vector, which probably most patients uh, with an incomplete paralysis are not going to need. But one thing that you may consider in these patients is doing more of a kind of a single vector, uh, gracilis free flap, right? Kind of in an anatomic position, uh, maybe more in line with the zygomaticus. Um, and this could be useful for patients who perhaps just need a little bit more dental display, right? More of a vertical elevation, maybe not so much more commissure movement. Um, but again, I would say to go to this level and go all the way up your kind of uh, stair step ladder, uh, your reconstructive ladder, so to speak, for uh, facial paralysis at least, is not something that you're probably going to need to do a lot for incomplete facial paralysis, okay? Um, so we've gone on and on about input, all right? But again, we can't only talk about input uh, because, you know, I kept harping about maintaining the balance, right? This is a push and pull, and I think, you know, those of us who are involved in treating these patients uh, realize that hypertonicity um, is if not an equal part, maybe even the major player, right, in incomplete facial paralysis. And so we definitely need to be addressing this for our patients. Um, and so this is where I'll talk about weakening wires, right, as opposed to increasing input. And so we know uh, that Botox is certainly great for this, right, not only on the affected side, but also on the unaffected side, right? So on the affected side, treating the orbicularis oculi, if you have severe synkinesis there, is great. Um, treating the hypertonic platysma as well. And on the unaffected side, right, using Botox to just improve the symmetry. So getting the frontalis to make the brow smooth across uh, both sides, getting the uh, DAO on the unaffected side uh, in order to improve smile symmetry. But the question is, um, for those patients who are getting Botox every three months, are there ways that we can kind of permanently enact the changes that we see with Botox so the patients aren't having to come in every three months. Um, and so for, I guess, almost a decade now, we, you know, or probably more so than that, we've realized that we can permanently uh, affect those changes uh, by doing things like myectomies, right? 
And so doing a platysmectomy, rather than increasing, you know, having to repeatedly inject Botox, I can give patients a great change. Uh, this was just a paper and some images out of uh, Tessa Habach's group. Um, and they noted an improvement um, in a face score with this. So at the time they were using that, um, you know, regardless of whatever score you're using, a Sunnybrook scale, face scale, E face scale, um, we know that this does improve that and has improvements in quality of life. Uh, some patients will tell you that they are feeling that tightness, that pulling in the neck if they have severe synkinesis uh, with their incomplete paralysis. Um, and this is something that can be done under general or potentially even under local, right? So it's a very quick option for patients um, and potentially avoids the need for them to have to come in for Botox. Uh, the other muscle that's been receiving increasingly uh, uh, more attention is the depressor angular oris, right, on the affected side, right? So we talked about injecting Botox on the unaffected side, um, but what we're finding is uh, weakening the depressor angular oris on the paralyzed side, that synkinetic side, can have a profound impact for patients. Um, and so this is, again, some data out of Mass Eye and Ear looking at uh, temporary weakening of the ipsilateral depressor anguli oris with local, okay? Um, and when they did that, they noted uh, significant changes um, in the commissure excursion, right? As well as the angle. So there was a more favorable angle, right? Superior placement, uh, as well as increased distance, just with weakening that one muscle alone. And equally interesting, when they asked lay observers then uh, to try to uh, guess as to what emotion was attempted uh, with smiling uh, after injection of this, before the injection, um, about 35% were able to say, yes, they're trying to display a positive emotion, trying to display a smile, right? After injection, 65% right, were able to say on that side, yes, you're trying to display a positive emotion, okay? Um, and that is potentially even with very little change in the commissure, right? There was a statistically significant change, but it's not like it's a large change, right? And so this is just, you know, there's, so there's been increasingly efforts into looking at potentially even permanently disrupting that muscle, okay, to affect that change. And so why even with small changes in that commissure uh, excursion, uh, do we able, are we able to see that there's a positive emotion being displayed, right? Well, I think that's because the smile is about much more than just how much that little corner moves, right? So when we look at the Duchenne smile, there's multiple components to this, right? There's dental display, there's gingival scaffold, there's the gingival scaffold width, okay? And so we know that everyone has an asymmetric smile, right? Um, until you get, until that asymmetry becomes greater than say maybe four millimeters or so, um, we don't really detect the difference, right? And so we're able to tolerate uh, some change in oral commissure if we can get some improvements in these other areas, right? And so patients with severe synkinesis have what I'm terming a frozen face, right? I, I titled this push and pull because it makes for a nice little title, right? But it's not really a push and pull, right? It's a pull and pull. So these patients, some of them, yes, some of them may have weakness in the zygomaticus muscles or in the frontal branch, right? But a lot of times the mid-face, the zygomaticus, is, is an attack actually, right? It's attempting uh, to pull that smile up, but the problem is we have hypertonic lip depressors, right? that are attempting to pull it down, right? And so essentially both muscle groups activate and then that commissure just stays frozen in place and we can't lift the lip up, okay? And so what we have to do is unlock that smile, unlock the frozen face, okay? And so when we're talking about hypertonicity, we're talking about weakening an already weakened face. And this can be quite counterintuitive to patients, especially if the health literacy of them is potentially a little bit lower. And so what can be pretty helpful in these patients, and all patients really, is uh, what is the lidocaine test. Um, and so just injecting a milliliter of 1% lidocaine to the ipsilateral depressor anguli oris uh, can impart a change and potentially improve the smile it can help them uh, understand that why we're talking about potentially weakening some of the uh, some of these muscles. 
And so this is a patient um, who uh, had had Bell's palsy and an incomplete recovery. You can see the asymmetric smile there. You can see the asymmetric dental display. Um, and so you can inject a milliliter of lidocaine in the office. Uh, usually to hit the, the DAO, you can just do one uh, millimeter lateral and an inferior to the commissure and generally you'll hit it most of the time. And then you wait, right? You, so you wait 10 minutes or so, you let the lidocaine take effect and then you go back and you look again, right? And so her smile is much more symmetric, right? Certainly not perfect, right? But to a lay observer, right? Again, we can tolerate some amount of asymmetry. And so she has almost, uh, you know, another tooth and a half of dental display and increased gingival scaffold width as well. Now, she, her commissure certainly has moved some, but not dramatically, right? But it just goes to show you uh, a smile is not all about just that commissure movement, right? There's multiple things that we're taking into consideration uh, to improve the symmetry. And so now the question becomes, you know, Botox is great, right? But how can we um, replace Botox, right? And so I'll talk about some uh, of the newer things uh, that we're investigating and trying for these incomplete facial paralysis. And so one is, you know, we've talked about weakening that DAO or weakening those uh, lip depressors. Um, is there a way to permanently do that without Botox? And the second is, you know, oftentimes uh, that frontal area, the frontal branch is more tonic, right? I, I feel like anecdotally, most of us see more weakness in that area as opposed to hypertonicity, um, although technically either would be possible. And so to address those lip depressors, uh, the selective neuro neurectomy comes into play. And this is uh, what's kind of pioneered and championed by uh, Dr. Aziz today out in California. And his technique actually through a facelift incision, he goes in uh, and you identify all the lip depressors and ligate those facial nerve branches, right? While preserving the elevators and preserving the marginal mandibular branches. Um, simultaneously, when you do this, you can also uh, do a platysmectomy as well uh, to help with that uh, platysmal banding and the platysmal hypertonicity, right? And so his initial description of this was, was in 2018, but he actually uh, just released uh, in 2019 this past year, uh, his retrospective review of uh, his uh, first 63 patients that underwent this. Um, and he used the E-FACE uh, scoring system uh, to investigate uh, improvements. And, and so in all 16 parameters of the E-FACE score, there was was a significant difference and an improvement uh, after uh, performing this selective uh, neurectomy procedure. And so the other thing that, uh, and again, this is, I would say is more on the early side of things, right? But for patients who have that persistent uh, brow ptosis or lack of tone there in the frontal branch, you know, we already use cranial nerve five, we use the masseter branch for those five, seven. Right? Can we use cranial nerve five then uh, to innervate the frontal branch? Right? Because there is a deep temporal nerve uh, that potentially is in close proximity with that frontal branch. Um, and this is the feasibility study of a neurosurgery group in 2018 that essentially is just looking at, is it feasible to take that deep temporal nerve, mobilize it, um, and then anastomose it to the frontal branch? Um, and in just this feasibility study, at least, that they found that it was able to be co-opted uh, to that temporal or frontal branch and all of their uh, cadaveric specimens. And that certainly makes sense if you just look at the anatomy and its proximity. Uh, the deep temporal nerve is about a centimeter posterior to the jugal point. On the left here, you can see. Um, the other landmark you could potentially use is the, it's about four centimeters anterior to the tragus. And then you want to do it about one to two centimeters superior to that point. The issue with trying to mobilize it too much is that we know that there's a decreasing number of axons the more distal that you go. Um, and so if you're trying to drive movement or, or at least tone, you want to try to get as many axons uh, as you can. Um, and the, since then, there hasn't been that same neurosurgical group, I believe, uh, did at least do it in one patient documented uh, tone and voluntary movement. Um, but again, this, I would say we don't have a lot of data on, uh, but this, these are a few pictures of a cadaver project that I was involved in. Again, just demonstrating, right, you can see that it's, at, it's very close proximity. There's the deep temporal branch um, and your frontal branch as well. 
And so this is interesting, right? Because from an extended facelift approach now, we have a lot of options for these patients, right? We have a five masseter to seven buckle transfer that we could potentially do if needed. We have a five temporal, deep temporal branch to seven frontal branch that we could potentially do. We have a selective neurolysis we could potentially do. Again, all through this facelift and, uh, incision, right? So one approach for potentially up to uh, three procedures. So we have our bird's eye view of everything we can do, Botox, nerve transfers, neurectomies, myectomies. Um, but the question now is, you know, who do we actually do this on, right? Who do we operate on? When do we do it? Okay. And so, you know, there's been a number of projects out there that's trying to determine prognostic factors to identify patients ahead of time uh, that are going to have poor outcomes. Um, and there's things in our literature about there about blink reflex, but you know probably the quote unquote gold standard is the electroneurography. If you take this at the nasolabial fold, uh, generally we know that degeneration less than 72% is a good prognosis, right? And so those patients will have about a 90% chance of recovery. And then with greater degeneration, right, we see a precipitous decline in the chance of recovery. Uh, with 90% being that cutoff. Certainly that's the cutoff we nerve we use right initially um, uh, for decompression of the facial nerve, right, in more of an acute setting. Um, but the problem is, right, ideally ENOG is performed between days 5 and 14. And let's be honest, I certainly have never seen a facial paralysis patient, right, a Bell's palsy patient has come into clinic and say, oh yeah, I got my ENOG at day six and it, you know, showed a 72.6% degeneration, right? I've never seen anyone get an ENOG uh, or come in with an ENOG uh, for a Bell's palsy, right? And so that's not really that useful for us, right? And certainly ENOG is not available everywhere. Um, and so we really would, it'd be great to have some clinical indicators uh, to be able to help counsel and guide these patients, right? So the, actually, we kind of have this, right? At least uh, a, a model to help guide patients, right? So this is a paper out of 2012, actually, right? So quite a few years ago, right? That was looking at a prediction model of non-recovery in Bell's palsy that looked at Sunnybrook uh, grading scales. So this is one of the largest cohort of patients available in the literature with Bell's palsy, 829 patients. Um, and what this group did was attempt to develop a clinical prognostic model. Now, if you read this paper, the great part is, and for the first half of patients that they analyzed, they used the half of these patients to build the prognostic model, and then actually validated with the remaining 400 patients. And so they looked at what were significant uh, predictors or uh, of basically non-recovery um, after about six months to a year. And so what they found was, and probably most useful for us is that if you can get a Sunnybrook score one month after the initial injury, then that was a predictive factor for non-recovery, right? I mean, at baseline or age and, the, and whether or not they got treated with prednisone were also contributing factors. But I would say for most of us um, in facial plastics, right, we're not seeing the patients initially and we may not even be seeing them on days 11 through 17. Um, but probably we could uh, see them at one month, right? And so if we get a Sunnybrook score, then we could potentially use this model to help counsel patients. Um, and so again, just to show you again, if you haven't seen it, uh, the Sunnybrook score, again, more useful than the house Brackman because it takes into account resting symmetry, voluntary movement, and synkinesis. And using this model, uh, they actually were able to develop this curve, right? And so they defined complete recovery as a Sunnybrook scale of 100, non-recovery as a Sunnybrook score less than 70. And you can see here um, that a Sunnybrook score of about 70 or greater at one month, right? You have essentially a 0% chance of having a non-recovery. But the lower that score is, right, at one month, the higher the chance is for non-recovery. And this certainly makes sense with what we already know, right? We know that a more severe paralysis initially is certainly going to give you a higher risk of an incomplete recovery and synkinesis, right? Um, but what this does, uh, this model does, is essentially try to break it down into percentage risks to help counsel patients. 
the same group uh, then a few years ago looked at synkinesis and developed a similar uh, prognostic model. Uh, and so they looked at one, six, and 12-month interval follow-ups. And, and then the large cohort of Bell's patients, they found synkinesis in 21.3%. You know, about 6.6% of those patients, they defined this synkinesis as moderate to severe, meaning that they would likely benefit from some sort of intervention. And on the left, so on the left here, you can see the, the risk of persistent synkinesis, right, of any kind based on a Sunnybrook score at one month. And then on the right chart B here, this is their risk of a moderate to severe synkinesis based on your Sunnybrook score at one month. The other interesting find in this study is that they found that synkinesis, if present at six months, actually tended to worsen at the 12 month follow up. Um, and so if you already have it at six months, chances are it's certainly not going to get any better. Okay. So how does this help us, right? Now, this is certainly not perfect, right? But I think this is a great tool to help guide patients, right? And so if we have a patient that comes to us at one month and their Sunnybrook scale is say 13, their chance of non-recovery, we can say, hey, your chance of non-recovery, probably greater than 70%, right? Your chance of potentially a debilitating synkinesis or a very noticeable synkinesis is somewhere close to 30%. As opposed to patients who come to us maybe between 50 and 60, um, whose risk of non-recovery is much, much lower and certainly the risk of, so, of a severe synkinesis is less than 5%. Um, and so, well, you know, my question is, can we use this to help guide us uh, to patients who may want to consider earlier operative intervention? Now, you know, I put here, oh, a new algorithm. I, you know, this is certainly not the way most of us would practice now. Um, I think the vast majority of us would still counsel patients to try Botox first to see that they like it. Um, and not necessarily to rush into anything. But my point here is that rather than, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting uh, for patients to stabilize after this before you do anything more aggressive, you know, based on the information that we have, if you have synkinesis at six months and a poor uh, Sunnybrook scale, you know, chances are things are only going to get worse in terms of the synkinesis. And so the question becomes, is it potentially reasonable to offer a surgery at six months? Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Again, I don't think that's what most of us would, are doing or routinely be doing. Um, but it's something to think about, right? Uh, because some of these patients uh, just don't want Botox, right? A lot of them do great with simply Botox alone, um, but some of them won't, don't want the hassle of coming back in all the time, right? I think my final point here um, is don't be fooled, okay? Incomplete facial paralysis patients are cosmetic patients in disguise, right? In my mind, you know, these patients are true cosmetic patients. They don't have the same functional deficits as patients with complete paralysis, right? Their eye is generally protected. If anything, right, there's too much tone in that eye, right? They don't have issues uh, with oral incompetence, right? They're coming to you because they don't like how they look. They're self-conscious, right? Um, and so the treatment for these patients uh, is really, in my mind, should be tailored individually, right? And so you need to have all these tools to be able to offer the patient so you can, you know, basically be able to counsel them as to what maybe best fits their situation. And that may be just Botox, right? But it could be all, you know, a gamut of the, all the other procedures that we've talked about. Um, you know, I think a big part when you see these patients in your clinic, especially the ones uh, that are coming in with incomplete paralysis, they're kind of self-selecting um, as, to, as to be a little bit um, pickier, right? They're very concerned with their appearance. And I think the issue is a lot of these patients they've been shocked by their initial Bell's palsy, which you know, was much worse right, than what they are now. But I think in their minds, um, a lot of them still picture themselves as having that very totic, uh, disfiguring uh, appearance, right? And so the, the fact is that part of your goal is, is to help them realize that they're not as asymmetric as maybe that they think they are, 
um, and that there are tools that we have um, to be able to help them. And so looking ahead, I think some of the questions that we have, particularly as we're looking into potentially these uh, temporalis to frontal transfers, what are the long-term consequences of that, particularly if we're using both the master and deep temporal branches? Are there, is there temporal wasting? Do we affect mastication when we take both of those? I don't know that. I don't think we know that yet. Um, patterns of weakness for incomplete recovery. What do, what do I mean by that? I think anecdotally for these incomplete recoveries, the frontal branch we feel like tends to often be a little tough. Any particular numbers or I'm not aware of any particular numbers on that, that would be a good thing to know. And then this question of earlier intervention, which I've uh, kind of hinted at. Um, again, I don't think that's standard across the board um, in terms of you know, offering people you know, prior to a year out, uh, but it's certainly something to think about, at least based on some of the data and some of the uh, information we have available in our literature. Uh, um, and so these are all of my uh, references. And I will open it up to potentially any questions. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone who logged on and I know they've been recording these as well. Um, and so I'll uh, try to send my slides uh, to University of Kentucky as well if you guys want these to refer back from. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.